that we're very happy to have you at the third edition of the South American Dark Matter Workshop. As you might have probably guessed uh, from the name, uh, that's the third edition. That means that there were two previous editions before this, and these editions were taking place at ICTP Safer, which is an institute which is located in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And the previous two editions that you can probably see in here, and maybe um, that will look a little bit more normal, um, the previous two editions were in 2017 and 18. My God, I, I've lost a little bit track of it. Um, and and Fafadi, you... sorry, we are not seeing the, the screen. We are just seeing... We cannot. A... No, we can't. That's unfortunate. Let me try that again. Can you now? Now, yes. yes. Okay, so the first edition took place in 2017. The second edition took place in 2018. Uh, so this is a regular meeting. We're welcoming you to the uh, virtual version of the third edition, which was by no means supposed to be virtual. It was supposed to be in person and in Sao Paulo. And, uh, but we are confident and we hope and we knock on wood and cross fingers and whatnot that the next edition will be live, will be in person and we'll be able to hug and touch each other and it's gonna take place in Sao Paulo. So a little bit about the workshop. Um, this is a series that started in 2017. Enrico, myself, and Manuela Vecchi, who is, I guess she's connected right now, we started this, um, this workshop to try and bring together the community of dark matter within South America and uh, reaching out to where the rest of the world, um, bringing together the different expertises that are needed for dark matter. So particle physics, indirect searches, direct searches, phenomenology, astronomy. We're very happy that since the beginning, the, the, the workshop was able to bring people together from different, different expertise and different fields. And it continues today, as we have seen, and as you know, we have a very rich program that is also ranging throughout the world. So in spite of what's going on around the world, we thought that having the workshop, and maybe probably just because of what's going on, it was a strong signal that we are here, that we're doing science together, and that we're connecting through science. This is extremely important in South America. The ICTP Safer was an institute that was born as an offspring of the, as a local center of the ICTP, the Father Institute in Trieste, that has the mission to bring science to developing countries and, so sorry, developing um, in countries around the world. And the Safer was supposed to be a center and it's acting as a center to um, make connection within South America and reaching out to the world. And we think that was important to keep this. Now again, the expertise, the different expertises are very well represented uh, here in this workshop and the others. And, um, and we hope that this will also start collaboration and will prompt people to talk to colleagues throughout South America and all over the world. So some more things that I wanted to share with you about the workshop. So, um, as you know, we have a very dense program that you can probably see at this point here. And uh, we have had, um, unfortunately and regretfully, to um, condense it very much. We couldn't give a lot of time to everybody, but that was in the spirit of giving the possibility to more people to speak. So some people will, will be presenting their research in a poster session. The poster session will take place on day two, which is tomorrow, at 4 p.m. Brasilia time, which is 8 p.m. Central European time, and you can convert it as you wish, and then your time zone. And because of time zones and because of other many uh, constraints, we really ask you to be on time. We're not happy, but we will, if we will have to um, sort of break your speaking, we will have to in the interest of everybody. So we're really not happy about it. We like to have more time for discussions, but this was a very uh, difficult compromise and we would kindly ask all the speakers to stay within the same times. Concerning poster session, we will give some more detailed information tomorrow. And concerning the technical part, for those of you who are asking, um, so, there's gonna be a chair, two chair people per session. One is gonna take care of the speakers and the other one you can address the questions to. 
So we would kindly ask you at the beginning of the session, we will say who the person is and you can send your question to the chairman, which I think for the next session is Yvonne. Is that correct? Yvonne? Yes, yes. I'm going to take okay, care so of this picture uh, and, uh, and Yvonne is going to take care of the questions. Oh, Good. okay. So for the next question, the session, you can send questions to Yvonne and uh, she will collect the, the questions and uh, give them to the speaker. Um, for what concerns technical problems, you should see a person whose name is Tiago Cotignotto, ICTP. And it, he has an ICTP in his uh, ID name. And in, please send him a message if you have any technical problem like the screen is not working and seems like everybody else uh, has the screen working. So, and if there is any additional problem, you can contact another uh, one of the, uh, the chairmen, but please contact Tiago first. He will very likely solve your problem. This said, um, again, this program was not supposed to take place online, it was supposed to take place in Sao Paulo, especially because South America in this moment uh, has a lot of activity going on. There is another workshop that will take place next week, and um, you're welcome to connect to that workshop next week. And also we will have a joint discussion on their second day, which is December 8th at 13.45 in Brasilia time. Okay. And uh, we will figure out what to discuss about in the meantime. And before we get to the science and thanking all the speakers, all the participants beforehand for being with us, um, I would like to share one moment of silence in the memory of a faculty that was at Safer from the beginning, he has been working in different subfields connected to dark matter, but not only. His name is Eduardo Ponton. He was, uh, he was an inspiration for all the students and us that were working there. He passed away last year and um, we honor his memory by doing science and by doing science together, which is the respectful way and the creative way that he liked. So after this moment of silence, I will give the microphone to Gianfranco, our first speaker. Very well. Thank you very much for bearing with me until this point. Um, again, if there are any questions, I hope you can uh, address them to everybody, uh, to the right persons, actually. And uh, maybe, Enrico, we should, we should get it rolling. Gianfranco, are you online? Yes, I am. Yes, okay, so Gianfranco, can I ask you to share your screen, please? Sure. Great. So I will give you a warning uh, after 20 minutes uh, and then uh, yep. about uh, each five minutes after that until you reach the end. And let's see how it goes. Okay, so please. So everybody, it is really a pleasure to have to start the workshop with Gianfranco Bertone from Grappa Institute. So Gianfranco is going to give us uh, a, a review about searching on, uh, on dark, ma of dark matter. And his talk is titled A New Era in the Quest for Dark Matter. So Gianfranco, please feel free to start whenever you want. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Should I keep my uh, camera on? Would you prefer? Uh, as you prefer, actually. Maybe you can turn it on uh, for the question. Just switch so it on. Maybe, yeah, it's easier. I, I find it easier personally to, to follow the discussion when I see someone uh, speaking. Okay, um, that's great. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Enrico. Thanks to, to you. Thanks, uh, Fabio, for the invitation. Thanks, uh, Yvonne. Um, I, I uh, was actually moved to, to see the the photo of uh, Eduardo Ponton, you know, he was uh, uh, at Fermilab when we were postdoc uh, now 15 years ago. Uh, I have very fond memories uh, of, uh, of him. And you know, we, had, we spent very good time uh, together. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's missed uh, certainly in our, in our community. So thanks Fabio for, uh, uh, for, for that. Um, so my talk is the first of the, of the conference. So I thought that maybe just a big picture type of talk would be appropriate uh, to get uh, started. Uh, at the beginning, I was trying to uh, add references throughout my presentation to uh, the talks that would be given by, by others. But 
all the talks really are relevant, basically to, to what I, I said. So, you know, I just stopped very quickly uh, uh, doing that. I will just refer to um, you know, sessions that happen during um, uh, during the conference, just so that um, uh, so that it, it's clear to what I am referring to as I as I speak. And uh, towards the end, uh, the, towards the second part of my talk, uh, I'll, try, I'll, I'll try also to add some substance and to uh, present some more uh, technical material. Um, and what I would like to, to start with, actually, is um, a, um, a sort of a preamble on, um, on the dark universe narrative, on how we present the dark universe narrative, in particular when we talk about dark matter, both at technical conferences and where we talk uh, to the outside world, when we talk about what is dark matter, what is the meaning of dark matter and the dark universe in general. Now, the, the first uh, thing I wanted to say is that I, I think we can do better as a community when we, uh, when we describe the history of uh, the subject of, uh, of this conference, which is dark matter. And in particular, if you, if you go to a random conference, you often, very often hear things like, you know, the term uh, dark matter was coined by its wiki in the 1930s. And then, uh, you know, Vera Rubin proved its existence in the 1970s by discovering flat rotation curves of galaxies. And both are, you know, very gross oversimplifications um, uh, of, of how, you know, how the actual history played out. And if you go back and, and read the history of the, of the subject, you will see that the, the very term dark matter, you know, was already in use many decades before, um, uh, before Sweeky used it in his papers. Uh, Lord Kelvin uh, in 1904 was talking already about the fact that many of our stars, and perhaps a great majority of them might be dark bodies. Uh, he tried to apply his kinetic theory of gases to the distribution of stars in the universe that back then uh, was really the stars in the Milky Way, uh, you know, this well, 20 years before uh, we, we even realized, that, thanks to Hubble, that the Andromeda galaxy was an external galaxy, you know, something outside the, the, the Milky Way. Uh, so there was this kind of universe that uh, Lord Kelvin had thought about, and, you know, he was trying, really thinking about dark matter in the modern sense, you know, so he was trying to connect the uh, velocity dispersion of the of the stars that we observe with the the density of stars and when you can't cal calculate the density of stars you have to take into account the fact that some of them are not visible to your to your telescopes and you know maybe maybe dark and uh, uh Ari Poincaré only a couple of years after uh, Lord Kelvin he referred to his work and he actually used the term dark matter to describe these um, uh, these dark bodies that could not be seen with the telescope but contributed to the um, the dynamics, the, the, the density of matter in the universe, in the universe, and therefore to the uh, dynamics uh, of uh, of things we could uh, we could observe, and he used the term matière noire first in French, then translated it uh, to dark matter in an article that was published then in uh, 1906. So, I, well, I don't have time really to go through uh, the, the history of dark matter in this uh, in this talk, but I wanted to encourage you, if you have uh, um, uh, time and interest uh, in reading, I mentioned here two articles that we recently wrote, one with uh, Dan Hooper, it's called The History of Dark Matter, and the other, another one, which is a project of this um, um, uh, bright uh, PhD student in Amsterdam, whose name is um, um, Jaco Desvart, has been working on the uh, history of dark matter and he's been exploring in particular the, the, the period of the 70s when, when people started really to uh, connect the dots. Uh, so to put, uh, to try a, 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 and find a common solution to a variety of problems in, um, uh, in astrophysics and cosmology, flat rotation curves of galaxies, um, an excess of mass in galaxy clusters a la Zwicky, and the density, the average density of the universe uh, that, you know, back then people were thinking a lot about what the average density was because they wanted to understand what is the fate uh, of the universe. Does it expand forever? Does it re-collapse and so on? Okay, so this is all I want to say about uh, the, the, the history of dark matter, but you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask. And in particular, I encourage you to, uh, if you have an interest to, to read those, um, those papers. Uh, let me also mention very quickly another thing that where, another aspect that I think is um, um, 
discussed in a, in a way which sometimes creates more confusion uh, than, than anything else, which is um, the fact that we often refer to the fact that 95% of the universe is dark. Right? This was, if you look at the motivation uh, for the Nobel Prize in, uh, in physics, on the, you know, the text uh, uh, on the uh, website of the Nobel Prize, you will see that the prize for um, Jim Peebles was awarded for his work that demonstrated 95% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. And again, you know, what I'm about to say is probably com completely obvious to, uh, to many of you who've given you know, some thought about, about this, but this statement is really, you know, doesn't reflect anything fundamental about, um, about the universe. You know, this, this 95% is um, a statement that concerns very spe a specific epoch in the history of the universe, and it's true on very specific scales, you know, it's on very large scales. And without spending too much time on this, uh, if you if you if if, if you present um, uh, the uh, the existence of the dark universe in these terms, it becomes very confusing for especially for the general public to understand why you know everything around us seems to be done uh, seems to be made of uh, baryons and not by dark matter and dark energy. Why, if you draw a sphere around the galaxy like the Milky Way, uh, then uh, Dark energy doesn't appear at all as a um, uh, doesn't contribute at all at the matter uh, to the matter energy budget of the universe on the, on these scales. It's only when you go on very very large scales that you can see this uh, this contribution uh, of dark energy. So the fact that it's dominant has a particular implication uh, because of course it determines the the expansion rate of the universe. But if you care about how structures formed in the universe, for example. You know, the, the fact of insisting that 70%, 72% of the universe is dark, you know, it only creates uh, confusion. And then, especially if you, if you, if you ask uh, uh, what was the universe made of, you know, throughout the history of, uh, uh, of the universe, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, just standard cosmology, we'll see that very early in the universe, you know, everything was dominated by radiation. So, you know, relativistic species like neutrinos and photons. So in this, narrative, we would have to describe the universe as completely known after the Big Bang, and then evolving towards a phase where it becomes dark matter dominated, then it becomes dark energy dominated, and then it becomes all dark, or all uh, unknown, essentially. Which is, again, I, I, I think creates more confusion than, than anything else. So my preferred way of presenting this, uh, when we talk especially to the, to the general public, is really to focus on things that can be explained in a way which is simple, but at the same, same time accurate. So for instance, describing the evolution of the universe and the evolution of the density of the components of the universe as dilution of matter and energy uh, as the volume of the universe expands. And then if, not, if you don't have time to explain all that, you know, just referring to things like numerical simulations, that you start from uh, perturbations uh, for which you have a clear uh, observational anchor, observational starting point, which is the CMB. And then you start, you put that uh, as initial conditions in your supercomputer, you evolve the universe in presence of dark matter and, air, and dark energy, and you get something out of it that looks like the universe we observe. Now, after this preamble, I'd like to come to um, uh, the main focus of this, uh, of this talk, which is, uh, what we know about dark matter, and then especially what is our best way forward. Now, together with, uh, with Tim uh, Tate, um, a couple of years ago, we wrote a review article that has the same title as, the, uh, as my talk today, where we try to arrange uh, what is that we know about uh, dark matter, uh, and, um, and then what, what explanations have been put forward uh, for dark matter that we organize in this uh, mind map, uh, where you see there are, you know, the big circles are big kind of macro uh, areas. So we have light bosons that include things like uh, QCD axions. We have neutrinos, including the standard model neutrinos that we know contribute at some level to dark matter, no, not all of the dark matter in the universe. Uh, there might be things like surround neutrinos though. A lot of interest in the community went in the, uh, in the past few decades went into exploring the connection with the weak scale in particle physics. 
and uh, WIMPs, Whitney's Rotting Massive Particles, arguably the candidate that have been most discussed uh, in, the past, uh, in the past four decades. There's a possibility that dark matter is made of other particles and uh, you, know, you can have either uh, explicit models uh, for these particles or just study in a, you know, an effective way what are the properties, you know, whether they are self-interacting or whether they have some properties like superfluidity and, and things like that. And then there are the things that we uh, typically uh, ignore at conferences like, uh, like, the one, uh, like this one, which is the possibility that dark matter is made of macroscopic objects. And I think we will discuss uh, uh, this conference, the case of, uh, of primordial black holes, which is well, probably the, the most promising among the uh, macroscopic objects that have been uh, discussed so far. And then there is this other uh, possible solution, the fact that you know, dark matter is not in the form of uh, a, you know, a new particle, but that we need to rethink uh, how gravity uh, behaves. And, um, and I'm sure many of you have uh, already formed an opinion uh, on that. I will just say that it certainly, um, it's, it's certainly true that the universe seems to behave as uh, general relativity, as the theory of gravity, plus standard model of particle physics, plus one species of collisionless particles. So that doesn't mean that it has to be like that, but whatever theory of modified gravity uh, you know, one attempts to uh, put forward uh, to explain dark matter has to explain why it really reduces the standard model plus one species of cold, um, uh, collisionless uh, particles, NGR. Okay, so at the very least, this can be used as a starting point for building a new theory of gravity. Now, uh, many uh, searches have been, so a lot of effort went into the search for WIMPs in particular. So this particular connection that's for the, uh, this particular explanation that explores the connection with the weak scaling particle physics. I guess we will hear a lot about, uh, at this conference about direct uh, detection. Uh, there's the, the talk, uh, not the next one, the second next uh, talk will be about uh, a review of um, uh, direct detection. Uh, we will hear a lot about indirect detection. There are, and there are entire sessions dedicated to indirect detection of dark matter, and there are particle uh, accelerator searches for dark matter. So to cut a long story short, I think it's fair to say that no WIMPs have been convinced, no, there's no convincing evidence or definitive evidence for WIMPs uh, in any of these data. There are some hints here and there, and I guess we will discuss some of these uh, hints at this, uh, this conference, but you know, it's, it's, it's quite clear that the question is whether um, we can rule out uh, WIMPs as a, as a class of, of candidates already in view of the absence of evidence for these candidates. And, you know, my answer to this question is a big no. And uh, the, so the simplified version of, uh, of my argument uh, for, for this answer is that the, the rather obvious thing that Absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. And so far we have absence of evidence uh, for WIMPs. I had some more uh, technical comments uh, about that and I'm happy to come back to this uh, slide, but I suspect that Paddy Fox will uh, discuss in the next talk uh, about, about this. So I will, for the moment I will skip uh, this um, uh, more technical statements and move towards the, the final part of my presentation, which is really the way forward, okay? So we've seen that, well, in the preamble, we've seen that, you know, maybe we can build a better narrative uh, to describe what it is that we do, especially to the uh, outside world. And I think we have the narrative already. Um, then I, I mentioned the fact that we've been searching for a number of candidates so far, but we still do not have um, evidence for any of these, uh, convincing evidence for any of these uh, candidates. Uh, how do we uh, move forward in view of this? So in this uh, uh, review article that we wrote with, uh, with Tim, we argued that we could follow um, three main avenues. The first is to broaden, improve, and diversify uh, dark matter searches. And I think the, this conference and the one that will happen next week uh, will uh, explore uh, several ways in which this uh, can be done um, in the future. Uh, there are the uh, two other avenues on which I would like to spend a bit more time uh, in the in the minutes that uh, 
that are left uh, in my talk. One is how to best exploit the connection with astronomical and cosmological observations because they're becoming very good quality and you know, hopefully we can extract some useful information about the particle nature of dark matter from them. And then I have some final remarks about how to exploit uh, gravitational waves as really as a portal uh, to, uh, to understand and identify dark matter. So let me uh, uh, go to astro and cosmo observations. So there are clearly two um, sessions dedicated to astronomical and cosmological observations at this, uh, at this conference. I would like to uh, therefore to focus on one aspect which I don't think will be um, discussed by, uh, by others and on which we've been focusing quite a lot in the past uh, few years uh, at, at Grappa. So one of the standard predictions uh, in, um, of cold dark matter, in the cold dark matter paradigm is that you have a, a structure like the Milky Way is formed by the merger of smaller clumps of dark matter and that substructures of dark matter should exist uh, on scales way below the mass scale of dwarf galaxies, say. The question is, because they are completely dark matter dominated, they are more and more dark matter dominated, the smaller uh, they are in mass, how do we even hope, uh, can we even hope uh, to detect these dark substructures? And uh, new opportunities uh, arise from um, uh, new astronomical surveys that measure very precisely the position and motion of stars in our own galaxy. And this is a, uh, these are data collected by the Gaia satellite of the European Space Agency. Uh, there has, um, um, this, I think this refers to, uh, they refer to 1.7 billion stars. And this was released in April 2018. Now, the specific observable we are interested in uh, here is uh, the are called stellar streams. So these are streams of stars, almost one dimensional structures that are produced when things like globular clusters are, fall in the gravitational potential of the Milky Way and they are tidally stripped and produce these very elongated structures. We, we observe uh, these stellar streams, so there's no question that they exist. The question we asked, uh, in, you know, in our group and, and many other groups are actually following the same approach, um, what happens if you embed these um, streams of stars in a gravitational potential which is not smooth, there's a lot of granularity produced by the presence of these small scale substructures in the, in the Milky Way. And the point is that if you have this small scale granularity, imagine if you have this very cold and very kind of ordered uh, uh, systems where you know, stars move coherently in the same direction and the velocity dispersion in, uh, in the direction of orthogonal to the direction of the stream is very small. What happens if you have um, one of these small dark matter halos uh, that comes close to the stream and perturbs the stars and you know, kicks off some of the stars or displaces some of the stars creating uh, gaps uh, or in any case departures from a homogeneous, homogeneous distribution of stars in the, in the stream. So this can be uh, studied. There are a number of um, groups that have been studying, um, uh, in particular, a very famous uh, stream, very popular stream uh, for the quality of the, of the data that we can get is the so-called GD1 stream. It's an article by the group of Anna Bonassa and, and others uh, in January of this year, where they studied the distribution of stars uh, along uh, the angle that runs along the, along the stream. And they've noticed that there are several gaps and, uh, and also a so-called spur, another type of structure that, that you can observe in this, uh, in this stream. So it's as if the history of the, the evolution of these uh, stream is more complicated than just evolving in a small potential. How do you learn anything from, uh, from this? Well, one thing that um, uh, this, uh, um, postdoc, uh, who was a grappa, Neil Banik, uh, who's currently in um, A&M in um, Texas, uh, has done is to study the statistics of the departures from a homogeneous distribution of, uh, of stars in the, uh, in the stream. So what you see here is the power spectrum of these inhomogeneities as a function of the angle along the stream. And what you see here is that there are some data and if you only consider baryonic structures like molecular clouds and globular clusters that can perturb the stream, you really can't really reproduce the normalization of these uh, data points on large scales above, above 10 degrees. If you just take 
numerical simulations, you know, off the shelf without trying to do any tuning uh, to the, uh, the specific problem at hand and ask the question, where did, uh, what, what level of perturbations you induced uh, with uh, cold dark matter substructures, you will see that although the scatter is admittedly very large, you can easily uh, explain the normalization of the data points at large, uh, at large uh, um, angles. So without any tuning, this density flux. Let yep. me just tell you that uh, you're 21 minutes uh, in your talk. So you still okay, have five minutes plus 10. Okay, thank you. Um, so what, so what we see here is that the, uh, this, uh, this band you know, that corresponds to the prediction uh, for the level of perturbations induced by dark matter subhalos, when you add them on top of the ionic substructures, would allow you to explain the, uh, the observed homogeneities in, um, in GD1. Okay, so this is the result that uh, the NIL obtained last year. And recently we've been um, working on uh, setting up a method that doesn't require, uh, of course, when you, when you want to describe the distribution of stars in the stream, if you describe them in terms of uh, a power spectrum, so the statistics of uh, delta square, let's say where delta is the, is the density contrast of the, the stars in, in the stream, you kind of lose some, uh, some information. Ideally, you would like to use all the information about the position uh, of, the, of the stars and be a very sophisticated likelihood. But recently, we've been working with uh, um, a master's students and uh, the group of machine learning led by Gilles Loup uh, in, um, uh, in Belgium. And we set up a method uh, which is called the simulated based inference, where basically we uh, skip uh, this uh, very computationally expensive step of calculating likelihoods. And we derive interesting constraints again on the, um, on the mass of the dark matter particle, uh, starting from, uh, the, um, uh, from the observed inhomogeneities in, uh, in stellar streams. Okay, so uh, there are a number of other articles that have appeared after uh, around where the constraints have been applied on constraining uh, the particle mass of dark matter candidates of warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, and self-interacting dark matter. Because you can, for each of these models, you can establish a relationship between the properties, the, the mass and the couplings of your dark matter particle and the properties of these subhalos. So you can use this observable to constrain your dark matter models. And for those of you who are interested, there is this uh, very nice uh, physics report uh, that was uh, put together by uh, Matthew Buckley and Annika Peter in 2018, where these connections between astronomical and, and cosmological observables and particle properties of dark matter are explored in detail. In the last few minutes, let me uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on the connection with gravitational waves. Uh, I don't think I need to uh, tell you uh, that uh, gravitational waves, that are, you know, discovery of gravitational waves has really, has really opened a new window on the universe and opened really uh, incredibly exciting opportunities uh, for astrophysics, uh, but also for particle physics. And in, in uh, the next few minutes, what I would like to do is to explore at least one of the many uh, possible connections between the field of, dark, of gravitational waves and dark matter. And a particular uh, angle uh, that we'd like to uh, choose uh, for, for, for exploring this connection is that of the of dark matter over densities around black holes? We sometimes uh, sometimes is referred to as the dark matter dress around black holes. Now there are a number of scenarios where you would uh, the lead inevitably lead to the formation of these dark matter dresses around black holes. Uh, one was explored by uh, Gondola and Silk about twenty years ago now, uh, which is the so-called the dark matter spikes around supermassive black holes. The idea is that if you have a, um, a black hole, a seed black hole, um, growing in mass at the center of a dark matter distribution, as it could be like a standard navarro franken wire profile, uh, so you have a, like an R to the minus one uh, density profile towards the center of the galaxy, you start to grow the mass of the black hole, and then the, this, this power law profile responds to the growth of the central mass, by steepening, they're bringing the orbits closer uh, to the, the central mass. 
And uh, this process, uh, Gondor and Silk argued, could be uh, effective, for instance, at the center of galaxies like our own. In reality, we, we realized uh, that uh, there are a number of effects at the center of spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, these drops, uh, these, uh, these large overdensities. But it is still possible that these overdensities exist around intermediate mass black holes. You know, and by intermediate mass, I really prefer to anything, you know, from population three stars with uh, uh, so objects that, that arise from the collapse of population three stars with a mass of a few hundred uh, solar masses, all the way to direct collapse um, black holes with a mass of 10 to the four, 10 to the five solar masses. So also in that case, you expect an overdensity of, uh, of dark matter. Another possibility is that you could produce overdensities of dark matter around primordial black holes if those objects exist. And if the, in the universe you have um, uh, ultralight bosons, like uh, is predicted by a, a number of, um, of, uh, of theories that there was naturally in, uh, uh, in string theory, these ultralight bosons, for example, uh, then a number of authors have been um, uh, concerned with uh, the formation of ultralight boson clouds around these uh, the systems, which again can modify so the, the, what is in common to all these uh, uh, different uh, approaches is that you're modifying uh, the environment around black holes due to the presence of these uh, of dark matter or, or new particles. And uh, the, the, the kind of big picture uh, idea here is that we are going in the direction where uh, gravitational waves are going to produce a lot of uh, precision, uh, uh, a precision exploration of the black hole environment. And we want to understand whether these, the future observations will be precise enough to tell us whether there are these overdensities of dark matter. And if so, what kind of dark matter is, um, um, is there? What are the properties of dark matter uh, that accretes around, around black holes? And so there are a number of, uh, of open uh, questions. It's, it's just a, a, a field of research, I would say, in its, uh, in its infancy. But already we have some interesting results that I would like to, uh, to share with you today and then before, uh, before closing. Uh, Enrico, is it okay if I take uh, maybe two more minutes to describe uh, this? Yeah. Um, yes, okay, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the specific system I'd like to invite you to, to think about is one where you have um, an object at the center, an intermediate mass black hole at the center, and then you have um, a compact object, like another black hole or a neutron star, uh, much lighter than the central one, uh, that is orbiting around it. Now, as I said, there are reasons to believe that in a number of scenarios, the intermediate mass black hole might come with a dark matter dress around it. And the question is, can I discriminate? Can I, can I infer by looking at the motion of this uh, compact merger, and in particular by looking at the gravitational waveform produced as this compact object orbits around this uh, intermediate mass black hole, can I tell whether there is an overdensity of dark matter? And if so, can I say something about the nature of dark matter? Now, a few years ago, uh, a group um, led by Eda et al. Um, in 2013, uh, they've uh, solved this uh, uh, problem uh, in under a number of simplifying assumptions. So, for instance, you had the spherically distributed um, distribution of dark matter around the intermediate mass black hole. Uh, the slope is a power law of the kind that we had uh, um, in, estimated uh, and, uh, and calculated in the case of um, uh, intermediate mass black holes, the so-called mini spikes uh, scenario. And they've calculated what would be uh, the um, what would be the, the energy losses in that case. So the energy, the standard energy loss due to gravitational waves, plus uh, the energy loss due to dynamical friction, due to the fact that this compact object is not evolving in vacuum, but in presence of a dark of a, a density of, of matter. Now you can write down um, a relatively simple uh, differential equation for the evolution, uh, the time evolution of the separation that depends on the various parameters of the problem. And uh, the term that describes the dynamical friction, of course, contains the density of dark matter yeah, around this uh, the system. The problem is though that, and this is work done by Bradley, who will uh, speak on, on Friday, Bradley Kavanagh and uh, Daniele Gergel. If you look at uh, what happens when uh, um, when an object, when well, this is the case where two are two dressed 
object, two dark matter, two black holes uh, with a dark matter dress merge with each other, you see that the dark matter distribution doesn't really remain constant as the, two, as the objects merge. Okay, if I look, if you look again at what's happening, you have these two black holes that are approaching, there's dark matter um, around, around them. And when these two objects merge, there is a transfer of energy from the binary to the dark matter clouds. This transfer of energy can be very large and, uh, and also pretty kind of dramatic. Uh, you know, in, in this particular cases, the specific system we were interested in, uh, in, the, in this particular simulation concern, primordial black holes, uh, but also if you have uh, astrophysical black holes with uh, you know, one intermediate mass object and a smaller object orbiting around it, you do still expect uh, a, um, a transfer of energy because of dynamical friction. So you, this, this orbit has to plow through the distribution of dark matter. And as it does, um, it's, it gets slowed down. And uh, the energy lost by the secondary object is transferred into um, energy. Uh, well, let's uh, sort of, sort of uh, you, you, you're transferring energy to dark matter distribution the response by rearranging uh, its, its distribution around the black hole. So in order to solve this system, you have to do um, you know, something more sophisticated, which is really to write down an, an additional equation and evolve it at the same time as you evolve the orbit of the system that tells you how to adjust the phase space distribution of dark matter as the secondary object merges with the, uh, with the intermediate mass black hole. The final result, and Bradley Kamarag will tell you all about this uh, in his talk on, on Friday, is that you can calculate by how much the gravitational waveform that is produced gets defaced with respect to the, st the case of uh, um, the standard case of uh, um, GR general relativity in vacuum, so in absence of dark matter. And you can see actually that the number of cycles, so if you, if you look at by how much, how many cycles the, the gravitational waveform gets to face, this number of cycles can be very, very large. So with something like LISA, we should be able to detect these type of signals if over densities such as the ones uh, that were explored in this paper exist around, around black holes. The question then is how to observe them in the first place because they do not look like uh, GR in vacuum. So you need to do tailored searches. And then the next question, which are, we are uh, attacking now, is uh, if you manage to detect them, the, the, the detect these, uh, uh, these over densities, what can you say about the particle nature of dark matter? Okay, and for, the, for those of you who are interested in the uh, connections between gravitational waves and dark matter, there is a, a review article. I put here the, uh, the reference to it. And these are my conclusions, so I, I uh, conclude here, uh, Enrico. Um, let me just in 30 seconds say that this is a period of profound transformation for dark matter. In view of the absence of evidence, and I've repeated several times, is not evidence of absence of popular candidates. Uh, Large Hadron Collider, indirect detection, direct detection experiments may still reserve surprises. So I'm very excited and you know, very curious to hear uh, what other people have to say at this uh, conference about the prospects in those uh, different areas. At the same time, it's, it's urgent to diversify dark matter searches to exploit astronomical observations. And I mentioned also this gravitational waves portal, which I think is, uh, still deserves to be um, explored uh, further. And in general, my comment is that this, the field is now completely open and there are extraordinary opportunities for new generations uh, to come up with new ideas and discoveries. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gianfrancesco. Thank you very much, a very, very nice talk. Uh, so, unfortunately, we have reached the, the total time uh, allocated for your talk. So, if there are questions, uh, I would suggest uh, to contact Gianfranco directly or to appear next week uh, to our discussion session. So, let's thank uh, Gianfranco again. Thank you very much. And I think we thank can you. leave uh, the word to Paddy. So, next speaker Hi. is going to be Paddy Fox. Hi, Paddy. How are you doing? Good, let me just work out how to share my screen. And I uh, grew up in a town in which Calvin was born and I used to walk past a statue uh, every day on my way to school. And yet I didn't know this uh, fact about him. So thank you for telling me, Jan Franco, that was awesome. Uh, okay, great. Is that, 
Yeah, yeah. Working. Is that better? Yes, it is. Great. Okay. Okay. So next speaker is going to be Paddy Fox from Fermilab, and he's going to give us an overview about the status of theoretical candidates of dark matter. So Paddy, as before, I'm going to interrupt you somewhere in, in your talk and just let you know how much time you have left. So please. Okay, great. Please to go on. Thank you. And I apologize for this background noise. My son is uh, waking up and getting ready. So <laughs> there may be there may be noise. We may be disturbed at some point. Anyway, thank you for the invitation uh, to come to this workshop and uh, uh, for the uh, talk title. So the organizers asked me to talk about the status of theoretical candidates of dark matter. Um, let me see. Ah, there we go. So I tried to sum up what the, th the status of the theory is right now. And this was the most pithy uh, description I could come up with as a theorist. I, I'm speaking personally right now. Uh, I shouldn't be speaking on behalf of the whole field, but I use the royal we. Um, we don't know what we're doing, which sounds bad. Uh, but the flip side is we also know uh, not what uh, uh, what not to do. So we, we do know what, what we shouldn't be doing to understand or to describe dark matter. And what's uh, most interesting to me is both of these statements have seen enormous growth, you know, growth areas uh, um, over the last few decades. Uh, we've learned a lot more about uh, what the possibilities are for dark matter, what type of theories can uh, have the right properties to, to uh, have the phenomenology explain what we know about dark matter. And uh, we also have learned uh, uh, a lot about w where dark matter isn't. So the constraints on, on dark matter's uh, mass, for instance, or its couplings to the standard model are, uh, uh, are, all, are getting stronger all the time. Um, so if, if you wanted a summary of a summary, uh, we would say that uh, we're no longer searching for your advisor's dark matter. We're now looking for a whole host of new possible dark matter candidates, or at least we're using a whole load of uh, new models for dark matter. So uh, that is, of course, a one slide summary of my talk. So, so let me uh, uh, try to lead you to the same conclusion through my talk. So uh, here's an outline. I'll tell you a little bit of history of some of the theories of dark matter. I'll describe some of the recent developments. I can't possibly talk about all of them. Uh, I'll try to give you an abridged version of where we happen to be now. If there's time, which I very much doubt, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one. I'll, I'll dig into one of those directions uh, for um, uh, some of the changes recently in, in the dark matter model space, and then I will attempt to conclude. Okay, so if you go back a couple of decades to year to sort of year 2000, to pick a random number, and you were to, to, uh, to draw a number line and uh, ask an average theorist where on this number line you thought the mass of dark matter would lie, you would probably get a roughly bimodal distribution. So this is not a perfect accounting of the history, but roughly speaking, um, you would have found that uh, some subset of theorists thought that the dark matter was about 10 GV to a few hundred GV in mass. Uh, and they were thinking in the back of their minds about a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle, which at that time probably secretly meant uh, a SUSY neutralino of some guise or other. Um, or there was another uh, possibility that, that people thought about, which was something down in the micro EV range, uh, a QCD axion or something like a QCD axion. And uh, both of these were, uh, are still viable candidates. Um, they both have interesting thermal histories. If you, if you ask, how did the dark matter come to be? To how, how did we get just the right amount of dark matter in these two uh, broad scenarios? So taking the QCD axion first, yeah, I think you probably all know this story. The QCD axion is a, is a uh, boson associated with a uh, spontaneously broken global symmetry. So whenever you hear the word spontaneously broken global symmetry, you think, uh, of this potential. Uh, and the axion is in fact the, uh, the, the, the uh, excitation around the, the flat bottom of that potential, which is a massless mode, but at some point the universe passes through the QCD phase transition temperature and this, uh, uh, this potential gets ever so slightly tilted. So in fact, there is uh, rather than all the all points in this uh, circular direction being degenerate, there is in fact a minimum. And once the universe cools, uh, um, once the, the rate of expansion gets below the mass of this mode, it's free to evolve and it will do just that. And you'll find that although it's frozen at some random point in its potential initially, as the universe cools, it will uh, roll down to the bottom and start wiggling backwards and forwards around that minimum and behave just like uh, cold dark matter. 
So this is one way in which the axon can be made, the misalignment mechanism. Now go to the other part of the bimodal distribution, and we, we know this uh, story very well. There, um, you have a weakly interacting massive particle, which is to say there is something uh, around GV and mass scale that couples through weak interactions or something of order the uh, weak interaction size to the standard model that allows that state to be thermally produced in the, in the hot uh, early universe. And because it's coupled to the standard model, it, it can follow a thermal uh, distribution uh, shown here in the, in the dark black. And it will stay on this thermal distribution as long as it can, as long as it's allowed by its couplings. Uh, the weaker the coupling, the earlier it will detach from this thermal distribution because it's no longer able to, the rate of interaction is no longer able to compete with the Hubble rate. And at some point it will so-called freeze out and you'll be left with a, an abundance of this dark matter at the end of the day. And so that was the story for a, for a WIMP-like scenario. So the, the sort of common, though these are very, very different mechanisms, the commonality between them is that in describing them to you in this cartoonish way, I talked about one state. So I talked about either the axion or the uh, or the, um, the WIMP state, and really up to a few um, exceptions, maybe co-annihilation or something like that in, in the WIMP scenario, I really only need to talk about one particle, and the dynamics are driven just by the properties of that particle. So now fast forward to now and draw the same number line and, and, and take your uh, average dark matter theorist and ask them where they think or where they believe dark matter could live on this number line. And depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. But once you add them all up, you'll find that the range of masses is now far larger than it was back in 2000. Um, so you see there's, there's many buzzwords on this plot. There's many uh, um, uh, different names for dark matter and they cover different mass ranges. Uh, but you see that basically speaking, this WIMP range has grown and it's mainly grown to lower masses and the axion range has sort of grown uh, both to lower and to larger masses. Um, so before I move off this slide, there's a couple of things I just wanted to point out. Um, there, there, is, there is this boundary around 100 EV or KEV uh, uh, mass scale or so that says uh, um, if you are below that uh, mass, if you're below, let's say, 100 EV, then we do know uh, that the dark matter has to be bosonic if it's that light. And this is this goes under the name of the trimming gun band. Basically, the poly fermions suffer from a poly exclusion principle, which means it's hard to pack lots of them into a small space. Uh, and, in, and once you cross this, uh, um, this mass threshold, you can't pack enough fermionic dark matter inside things like dwarf galaxies to, to, to explain what the properties they have. So if you want to pack enough dark matter when it's that light inside a dwarf galaxy, the dark matter has to be bosonic. So we know there's this boundary. Um, and similarly, there is a lower band, but you can't keep uh, taking uh, bosonic dark matter and making it lighter and lighter because uh, of the de Broglie wavelength. Again, a sort of similar argument. Once the, the mass of the bosonic dark matter gets too small and its de Broglie wavelength gets too large and it can no longer be confined inside things like dwarf galaxies that we see. So even though, uh, in the last two decades, the range of possibilities has grown in both directions. There are still uh, uh, there are still limits, and there are things we know about uh, dark matter. I'll, I'll, even if we don't know where it lies in this plot, we know stuff about it once you tell me where it lies. Okay, so I won't spend as much time talking about the axionic end of this plot as I will talking about the uh, WIMP end of this plot, but um, but I should at least tell you a little bit about what's changed between uh, this limited range that we thought about originally and now this far larger range. So, so first thing to point out is, oh, I think I already said this, that if you're below the KV mass or so, then uh, dark matter is bosonic in nature. And it has to be heavier than 10 to the minus 22 EV, um, which is still a remarkably uh, light mass. Uh, and, and in this mass range, it's more appropriate to think of dark matter not as a particle, but as a classical wave, because the occupancy number is so large when these masses are uh, uh, so small. We know the dark matter on average in, in where we are in the galaxy is uh, about a third of a GeV per centimeter cubed. And when you're talking about individual particles of 10 to the minus 20 EV, that means you have a whopping great number of them uh, per centimeter cubed. Um, so, uh, Gianfranco mentioned it in, in his talk. One of the things that led to this growth is the fact that uh, axionic-like particles are ubiquitous in string theory. Um, and uh, so there's 
many other possibilities for uh, um, their couplings and their properties. And uh, uh, in the axion potential, which I drew way back here, there's essentially two free parameters that determine the, the shape of this axion potential. Um, one of them being the uh, breaking scale, and one of them being the scale, the breaking scale that leads to the to the uh, to this famous uh, this famous potential, and then the subsequent breaking scale which tips the bottom of the potential. So those are the two parameters, and here this is determined by the QCD phase transition. But there are many other possible um, uh, strong coupling effects. You could have additional theories like QCD, but with a different uh, uh, um, different size instanton effects that tip this potential by a different amount. And that basically taking the blinkers off in that way allows you to um, extend the range for the for the masses of the axion. Uh, at the same time, as theorists uh, realized the possibilities were more endless than they thought, experimentalists have been very busy. And this is what I think is very a common theme and is very exciting right now in dark matter is just as the possibilities for dark matter have grown, the capabilities to search for it have grown. And uh, what you see here is some attempted summary of all the different experimental techniques. So using either atom interferometry, torsion balances, uh, NMR type probes, and the, the uh, types of experiments that use these different techniques. And then the types of couplings that the axion could have that can be probed by these different experimental techniques and the ranges, over which, ranges of mass over which they're sensitive. And so even though the blinkers have fallen off and the mass range has grown by many orders of magnitude, um, the, uh, the capabilities to search for it have also grown. So that makes it a very exciting time to be thinking about these things. OK, so that was uh, um, a disservice to axionic dark matter. I apologize. I'm even thinking about axions right now, but uh, uh, in the allotted time, I can't give everybody equal coverage. So now let me spend a little bit more time talking about um, uh, the growth in the WIMP sector, or at least the growth in the, the mass of uh, the dark matter particle. Okay, so let me remind you, uh, it's at least early in the morning for me, so this is helpful for, for me. Uh, it may not be early where you are, but let me remind you a little bit about uh, what, we mean, what we mean by a, a WIMP. Um, so a WIMP, as I said, is a weakly interacting massive particle. So we think of it as a dark matter particle that, uh, that interacts through weak uh, couplings, things like exchange of the W or the Z or the Higgs boson, something like that. And because we um, we know the the mass and the couplings of those particles, we have some sense of the size of the cross section that such a wimp uh, particle could have, and that immediately leads to uh, a limit to this mass range that you saw, roughly speaking, between about a GeV and 10 TeV or so. And this GeV in particular, this lower band is the Lee Weinberg band. And this comes from the fact that we know the size of the, the interactions. And uh, so the cross section for scattering is uh, scales in a very simple way with the mass of the dark matter particle. And as you lower the dark matter mass, this uh, scattering cross section gets smaller. And uh, at some point, uh, you fall off this curve too soon. So you fall off this. Uh, um, thermal distribution too soon and you're left with too much dark matter in the universe and that's the problem. So that puts a lower limit of around a GV so, so the, the Lee Weinberg band, as I said, uh, for um, traditional wimp dark matter because we know all of its interactions. Okay, and uh, I should say that I, I was rather uh, glib when I said that most people were, th were thinking of a uh, SUSY neutralino. That was true at some point in our past, but we realized that the properties that make a SUSY neutralino uh, such a great dark matter candidate, the fact that there's a parity protecting it, uh, that, that's introduced for other reasons in supersymmetry, uh, that same or a similar parity, and in SUSY it's called R parity, and other models of beyond the standard model physics, there is often another parity that's introduced to uh, make it, uh, to hide some of the new physics and make it harder to look for it. Uh, basically, the result of this parity means that all the new physics has to be pair produced. And an upshot of that is the lightest particle that carries, that is odd under this parity, uh, will naturally be stable because it has no other state to decay into and then often makes a very good dark matter candidate. 
And that was the story in Susie, and that story uh, translates to many other uh, BSM theories. So uh, um, there is some version of the neutralino in extra dimensions and little Higgs models and so on and so forth. But all those uh, models were, well, well, not all of them, but they were often introduced uh, as an attempt to solve the hierarchy problem and therefore make direct connection to the weak scale. And so in many of those theories, this lightest parity odd particle has sort of weak size couplings and it's again, a perfect WIMP candidate. And uh, that's encoded in this famous WIMP miracle formula that uh, uh, something which has sort of weak size as couplings and a weakish scale mass um, does the job to be the uh, to be a thermal relic. So what allows us to go below this GeV mass? Well, it's sort of a, if you like a very simple observation. It's the fact that uh, in this definition of a wimp, I said that it, the wimp had to talk to us through uh, weak scale interactions through the W, Z, and Higgs bosons. What if there were other light bosons that it could talk to us through? If there were new mediators. So if there was something like something like a photon, call it a dark photon, although the photon, this is probably a very bad name because the photon, one of the defining features of the photon in my mind is it's massless. And one of the defining features in most of these models for dark photon is that it has a mass. So maybe I should call this a Z prime, but this is not my fault and the name is stuck. So we'll call it a dark photon. Um, but what if there was some vector boson relatively light that coupled to dark matter? and had some way of coupling to us. Or there was a relatively light a new scalar that coupled to dark matter or some other type of mediator. Uh, then this Lee-Weinberg band would be removed because the properties of this uh, mediator are separate from the properties of the weak bosons. And uh, that then allows, this new mediation mechanism allows the mass of the dark matter to be far lighter. And in fact, I, again, so what happens is the mass can drop all the way down to about a KEV scale or so before you end up uh, with problems with warm dark matter. But you still have this thermal relic story where you annihilate now not through weak interactions, but through these new mediator, dark mediator interactions. So that was the story. Uh, that's what's changed between 2000 and now on the theory side. Uh, and um, on the experimental side, if you open up the PDG like I did last night and steal the latest uh, uh, direct detection plot, um, it looks something like this. So you see there are many different experiments. Uh, they all have this common feature that uh, um, they, they work really well for a while and then they, there's some threshold where it's very hard for light dark matter to scatter off nuclei uh, in, 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 with enough uh, oomph to leave a signal in the detector. So this, I should have said, I apologize, is the plot of the mass of dark matter versus this, the size of its spin independent coupling to nucleons. Um, and uh, uh, this is the state of play as of last night. Um, and so what's happened is that we've crossed a few uh, Rubicons, if you like, between then and now. So if I was to, to just write down what I thought a uh, dark matter that talked to the standard model through a Z boson, what would it be the natural size for this quantity? I would get something of order this size, 10 to the minus 37 or so centimeters squared, which is way up here on this plot. And then, uh, uh, so long ago, we crossed the threshold of probing sort of dark matter that coupled through, say, the Z boson or something like that. Um, and now, even now, if you uh, open up your favorite dark matter model that talks to us through a Higgs boson, there's more uncertainty in exactly um, the size of that coupling uh, because the Higgs is not a gauge boson, so there's more flexibility in the way it couples. Uh, but you, but when you open up the papers and look, you'll see cross sections of order somewhere in this ballpark, and you see that some experiments are already crossing that threshold and are probing, uh, um, are ruling out uh, GV, 10 GV scale dark matter couples to us through a Higgs boson. So that's what's happened in, in in the two or three decades since we started doing these experiments. These lines have marched down from above the Z line to well below the Z line, and uh, and that motivated us to think about uh, um, dark matter candidates that uh, are not in this 10 to thousands of GeV range, but more are below in this region where these experiments have less sensitivity due to these thresholds I was talking about. So that motivates uh, from the experimental perspective, sort of the constraints perspective, thinking about this white space here. And, uh, um, and from the theory side, we, we know how to do that. Now. So you can ask yourself, uh, sorry, you know, still just to let you know yes. that 
you have five plus 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. I will talk even faster. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, you could ask yourself as a chicken and egg problem, but I, uh, you know, who came first? Uh, but I think that's what makes it so exciting right now is there's a real healthy crosstalk between the experimental communities and the theory communities. Uh, and uh, it's not clear who's driving, but they're, they're talking to each other. So let's see, um, let me think about where I can bail out. Well, okay, so let's um, jump in the TARDIS in the Wayback Machine and, and uh, talk about um, sort of a, a few of the, the stories that have led us down this path I'm trying to describe. So if we go way back uh, to around 2000 or shortly thereafter, uh, you know, there were these results from Dharma that got everybody very excited. Uh, there was a signal, that, there still is a signal that oscillates uh, and uh, people were wondering uh, how to explain it. And you couldn't explain it uh, at the time with a normal dark matter candidate and be consistent with no results from other experiments. And that led people like uh, Dave Tucker Smith and Neil Weiner to imagine the crazy idea that dark matter scatters in an elastic fashion. So when dark matter scatters off a nucleus, it changes into a, uh, a different dark matter state when it comes out. And at the time, this was a, a viable explanation for sort of evading constraints and still explaining a signal. It's no longer possible because the constraints have got a lot stronger. But, but this is a nice story because it, it's the first steps in, in the direction I'm trying to describe, which is you'll see in a second, is to make the dark sector a lot more complicated than a single particle, which is how we used to think about it. So here are sort of some baby steps. You, you can try to explain this interesting Dharma result by, by now the scattering involves two states from the dark sector rather than the original one state. I don't have time to go through why this works, but you are probably all experts, so you know anyway. Um, oh, what happened? Ah, okay. Now, a few years later, there was another interesting uh, anomaly, still is an interesting anomaly, that uh, the Pamela experiments, uh, Pamela experiment sees a flux, an anomalous uh, flux of high energy positrons in cosmic rays. So this is a, a, the positron fraction as a function of the energy as seen by Pamela. And you see these, this, is, this unexpected rise here uh, that's well fit by dark matter models. At the same time, they didn't see a flux of antiprotons, and this was puzzling in, in sort of the canonical dark matter model. And then people realized, well, if dark matter, instead of uh, annihilating into all, all standard model states, first annihilates into a new light mediator, so you see the same words showing up again, um, it, and this light mediator was below twice the proton mass, then you could explain this, uh, anti, uh, this positron flux without the antiproton flux because these uh, on-shell fires are not able to decay into protons and antiprotons, um, but are able to decay into electrons and positrons. At the same time, even though the spectrum is well fit by dark matter annihilation, the rate is far larger than you'd expect. But uh, um, again, a light mediator has this novel feature that uh, it's a essentially a, a new force carrier between the dark matter. And if the light mediator is light enough, it's a relatively long range force. And then that can lead to uh, a low velocity, a so-called Sommerfeld enhancement in the annihilation cross-section that occurs in late times uh, in the universe and doesn't happen at freeze out because there the velocities are too large. And so you can explain this large rate. So you see that uh, um, the thrust I'm trying to get at is that in the last few decades, um, uh, oh, somebody's trying to ask me something. Okay. so. Um, you, you see that in the last few decades, the sort of movement has been from dark matter being an addi a single additional state, maybe embedded in a bigger theory, but the rest of that theory is not so important for the dark matter, to a, uh, a whole sector with maybe it's with multiple states uh, involved in dark matter dynamics and with additional forces. And, uh, and that's the, the movement that's been going on. And this is not an unreasonable thing to happen. After all, the standard model is not just an electron and a photon and a proton, it's a very complicated uh, system with lots of interesting dynamics, uh, thankfully. Um, and so you might imagine that the same thing would be going on in the dark sector. Oh, and, okay, so if I can summarize basically uh, in, a, in a flippant way, dark matter model building pre all these excesses, and then the torrent of excess of models that, that showed up to explain the excesses, and then maybe this is how dark matter experimentalists now feel. Um, so that was some, uh, so let me dig into a tiny bit more detail in the remaining couple of minutes that I have. Uh, so so what, what happens when you, when you make this uh, 
change and add all this, uh, uh, extend the dark matter into a dark sector. Well, there's all sorts of cool stuff that can happen. So as I said, you have uh, a new force carriers. You can have all sorts of interesting dynamics that those force carriers could be an abelian gauge boson, a non-abelian gauge boson, could be new scalars, all of the above. Um, this can lead to dark matter being the object we see and could see in the lab might not be fundamental. It might be like the proton or the nu uh, uh, neutron rather of the dark matter world. It might be a composite object. Um, the uh, the thermal stories get a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting once you have strong interactions between the dark matter itself, rather than this rather simple freeze out scenario I was telling you about. You can have interesting processes, so called cannibalization, where multiple dark matter states can come in and fewer dark matter states come out. That leads to uh, interesting um, behavior of the dark matter distribution. When dark matter does couple to us, it may maybe does so through a form factor now because it might be composite, as I said. There could be inelastic dynamics because there could be multiple states involved in the scattering. Dark matter could couple to us through our photon because it maybe carries a very small uh, electromagnetic dipole. Going one step further than composite dark matter, maybe dark matter is actually an atomic state inside its own system. Um, and then dark matter self interactions can change uh, the distribution of dark matter on galactic scales. So these are all these all become interesting possibilities now once you extend uh, the, to a dark sector. Um, so given time, maybe I'll skip this slide. So the, time, the, Freddy, you still have uh, nine minutes. So. Oh, I still have nine minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you yeah. freaked me out with the uh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a uh, five plus ten of questions. But if we do the ah. questions at the end, then you still have okay. nine minutes. Okay, I'll keep yes. going. Take your time. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so the other opportunity that arises when uh, uh, you imagine that the dark sector might contain additional light states is those light states are something that we uh, may have access to. They're light enough potentially to be produced at, uh, in terrestrial experiments, and they provide an alternative way to, to get access to probe the dark sector. So um, this leads naturally to the concept of portals. So you ask yourself if there are light uh, bosons around, how can they couple to the standard model, irrespective of how they couple to dark matter, how can they couple to the standard model? And then you, you're led to these various types of uh, so-called portal interactions. So these are the lowest dimension operators I can write down in the theory. So here, uh, this is the, uh, the field strength of the photon, and then this is the field strength of some dark photon. And this is a dimension four operator, so it's one that is allowed to be written down, it's a relevant operator, and it couples our photon or our gauge bosons rather to the gauge bosons of the of the dark sector. This would be what's called a kinetic mixing portal. Um, skipping over this one for now and going to this, if you have, uh, if the mediator in the dark sector or there is, if there is a mediator in the dark sector, which is a spin zero boson, then there's two types of operators you can write down that couple it to our Higgs boson, either dimension four or dimension three operator, depending on uh, the exact properties of the, of the dark scalar. Um, if there's a fermion uh, with no standard model gauge interactions in the dark sector, then it can couple through the neutrino portal. This is a portal we may already be probing through neutrino masses. Um, and then uh, if, if there's a, you can also have an axion portal where an axion from the dark sector would couple to, uh, to, to E and B of the, of the standard model. So, uh, so there are these many possible portals. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but the one that's received the most interest is probably the um, the one Bob Holden wrote down before he, before uh, all of this, a long time ago, back in the 80s, the kinetic mixing portal. So uh, um, if there is a, if there is a U1 dark, so if there is a uh, an abelian gauge symmetry in the dark sector, it has an associated gauge boson, and it can kinetically mix through this portal with our um, uh, U1B, so with our U1 gauge boson. And uh, the result of this uh, relevant operator is that standard model fields, although they have no intrinsic charge under the, the dark sector, they pick up through this kinetic mixing. Anything charged under the standard model U1 will pick up a very small charge under the dark U1. So the standard model picks up a dark Miller charge. And then that means that, that standard model states can uh, produce this dark photon right, in various ways. 
and that this dark photon can decay to standard model states. And depending on exactly the mass thresholds in the theory, whether the, the, the dark, uh, whether the, the vector, the dark vector U1 is lighter or heavier than dark matter, maybe it's only available decays are into uh, standard model stuff. Uh, depending exactly what the thresholds are, you can even get interesting signatures like uh, this dark photon could live for a long time before it decays because it's maybe it's only uh, kinemat kinematically available channel is into dark matter, uh, is into standard model particles, but this kinetic mixing could be very small, which would delay its uh, decay. So uh, this sort of joining all these possibilities together and following the bifurcation tree of all these possibilities leads to many interesting ways you can search for dark matter and or the dark photon in terrestrial experiments. So uh, um, you could imagine a situation where an electron or proton beam is scattered on a target. And uh, in the process, you create through Bremsstrahl on one of these dark photons that decays, for instance, into dark matter. And you try to see this dark matter somewhere downstream. Or uh, uh, a very common avenue of attack is to take into account the fact that anytime you have a beam dump, you pr produce a lot of mesons. Some of those mesons, the pseudoscalar mesons in particular, uh, often have photonic decays, and anytime you can decay into a photon because of this kinetic mixing, you can decay into a uh, dark photon, which in turn might lead to dark matter production in these beam dumps. So in particular, people have been spending a lot of time thinking about how to repurpose uh, neutrino detectors because neutrino detectors have almost the uh, perfect setup, right? They have uh, a beam that hits the target with the intention of making uh, the light mesons of the standard model, which will decay into neutrinos, and they want to have a beam of neutrinos coming down here, and then they have a finely instrumented region nearby to sort of, uh, the purpose originally was to, to measure the normalization of how many neutrinos are coming out to this target, and then somewhere hundreds of miles away is another detector, and we want to measure the difference between the two and learn something about neutrino properties. But this is exactly what we need to take advantage of these light-dark sectors to uh, Perhaps in this beam is not just a beam of neutrinos, but a beam of dark matter. And then we have a finely instrumented region where dark matter could recoil off electrons or uh, nucleons and lead to a, a neutrino-like signal in the new detector. So people have been working out how to repurpose the new detectors at Mini Boon, June, and elsewhere for dark matter detection. Um, and as you see, people have not been idle. Uh, there are lots of curves on this plot. So in particular, this is a search for the dark photon in its visible decays into either electrons or muons. And you see that uh, there are many existing constraints in gray, and then there are many proposed searches, sort of either dedicated searches like this dark light or piggybacking on existing experiments like LHCB and, and doing dedicated searches there. OK, so I'm, I'm sure I'm running out. No, yeah, now you're almost run out of time. Good, 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 good. So I was going to tell you all about the inelastic frontier, but I won't. So I think I can summarize here. Uh, this echoes uh, something that Jan Franco was saying, that this is uh, um, a very exciting time with lots of possibilities. So this plot, again, is that number line I, I kept uh, uh, referring to. Uh, and in blue, are uh, possible dark matter candidates and where they lie on this number line. Uh, in green, uh, which was part of the reason this is so exciting, are all the different experimental search techniques we have out there, um, uh, and some of them existing and some of them, uh, some of them for the future. But they all, they, they taken together, they probe a large part of this mass range. And then maybe the most exciting thing is in red here. There, I didn't mention many of them, but there are, are some existing anomalies that can be explained by non-WIMP candidates, typically. Uh, usually things with a dark sector. And these are all slight uh, anomalies that may survive, maybe the tip of the iceberg, or they may go away, but, the, uh, um, but they can be probed right now and in the near future and uh, have potentially large implications for what the dark sector looks like. So anyway, this is an exciting time, both from a theory perspective and from an experimental perspective. And it's just a great time to be working on dark matter. And I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paddy. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Uh, so um, we don't have time again for questions, but uh, we, together with the other organizers, we decided to 
twist a bit uh, the program uh, just to make things a bit more spicy. Uh, so we will collect uh, questions uh, for all the speakers of the first session. So Gianfranco, Paddy, and Giuliana, who's going to speak next. Uh, after Giuliana's talk, uh, since we have uh, a small break. So please, uh, if you have questions, uh, send them uh, either to Ivoni or to me, and we will pass them on uh, to, the, to the speakers after all. So, Paddy, thanks again for the very nice talk. I think we can move on with uh, Giuliana. So, Giuliana, if I may ask you to share your screen. Hi. Okay, excellent. So it is really a pleasure to have with us Giuliana Fiorillo from the University of Napoli. So Giuliana is going to tell us about direct detections, a review of techniques and results. So Giuliana, please. We, we don't hear you, we cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, now yes, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Okay, so now I, am I still sharing the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Perfect. So thank you, thank you for this invitation. And I'm very happy to be, uh, uh, to participate to this workshop, although I hope, really hope I will be able to join you uh, next year on site because I would have liked to visit Sao Paulo. Um, I also would like to thank my, the previous two speakers uh, who gave me, um, uh, a few uh, statements to start with, because it's uh, quite difficult, as you heard from them, to give an overview of all the direct de detection techniques uh, and results uh, because of the current uh, scenario. The current scenario, which I uh, can extract from the previous two talks, is essentially summarized in two uh, statements. The first uh, uh, that was made by Gianfranco is that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it seems still interesting to look for uh, the dark matter in the form that we have been doing for the past 20 years. And from the second talk, uh, I uh, am taking home the message that it, it is worth to extend this search more or less everywhere <laughs> because we have ideas for all possible uh, candidates. So let me start from uh, a different view of the same thing that was shown uh, uh, earlier, both by Gianfranco and by Paddy. That is, we have uh, plenty of candidates uh, over so many order of magnitudes in the uh, parameters uh, uh, of their coupling uh, to standard matter and also of their mass, uh, that it is quite, quite difficult to imagine a single experimental approach or even a family of experimental approaches able to cover everything. On the other hand, it has been uh, um, the current um, paradigm for the past uh, 15 or 20 years to look uh, at the natural candidates. Uh, uh, so either in the, um, in the uh, region of the axion, let's say of the QCD axion or similar particles or in the region of the WIMPs and uh, um, essentially single particles that can account for the full uh, dark matter budget uh, and with couplings to the ordinary matter in, in the range of the weak interactions. This specific range, uh, that of WIMPs, has been enlarged recently to cover um, below 1 GeV particles. So as you heard from uh, Paddy, down to let's say MeV particles and up to hundreds of TeV. And the, uh, the current uh, overview of the experimental results is provided by this plot that it has been recently updated by the um, committee um, uh, formed by the uh, astroparticle agencies in Europe that has been working to review the current results and give a strategy for the future searches. And I can sum also summarize that this strategy essentially consists in covering the, completely this uh, uh, parameter space by uh, extending the searches down to uh, essentially fraction GeV or even uh, a few MeV in mass uh, up to 10 TeV uh, on the right side of the plot and down to well below, if possible, the neutrino floor that is uh, 
placed around 10 to the minus 47, 48 square centimeters for uh, the high mass range and uh, three orders of magnitude above that for the um, mass range below 1 GeV. So this was the plan already 10 years ago. Uh, the experiments have been uh, doing a lot of uh, progress in these years and they are still doing and there are uh, quite a few new ideas in order to explore the, um, the white part of this uh, plane, this uh, uh, space, which is not covered yet. All of these efforts are based on the assumption that these um, particles, uh, uh, let's call them WIMP, although as you have seen, uh, they might be uh, something also not exactly uh, neutralino-like. Uh, they, uh, in order to detect these particles that are around us, one thing that we can exploit is uh, uh, the possibility that they interact with a, a um, target uh, on, on the Earth, as it was suggested, on, uh, I don't know, at the beginning of, uh, of the 90s, maybe even earlier, there was a paper, a founding paper in 1985 uh, that was suggesting to look for nuclear recoils that would be the result of the interaction of a WIMP of, with a mass of the order of uh, an atomic nucleus uh, and with a velocity which is of the order of the relative velocity of the sun with respect to the galactic halo. In this case, what you obtain, whichever are the, your assumption for the coupling of the WIMP to the nucleus, you obtain a rate which is uh, exponentially decreasing and that's a really a bad thing for an experimentalist because uh, you don't have specific features uh, in this spectrum that you can try to detect in your detector. You have essentially a peak at zero energy released in your detector and uh, uh, an exponential tail, which can easily be confused with uh, natural radioactivity, also producing recoils in your detector up to uh, order of 100 kV, which is a, a really low energy for a particle detector. So you need a special particle detector, which is uh, essentially sensitive to very low energies, so low threshold, much, which is very big because you need a lot of uh, uh, target uh, in order to um, detect very small rates. Uh, at this level you see here in the plot uh, of 10 to the minus 45 square centimeters for the cross section you can predict the rate of the order of uh, one event per ton of material per year with very low energy in plus in addition. So um, your detector should be able to run stably uh, for years in order to integrate enough exposure um, and enough rate in case of a signal should be able to discriminate, to lower the backgrounds, but also to identify the backgrounds in order to uh, be able to identify your signal with respect to this uh, um, natural radioactivity. And uh, that is one of the main focus of the experiments because uh, um, this is very difficult to do because, as I said, you don't have signatures. Of course, uh, we know that uh, it could be possible, and actually it has been possible for the experiments to look for a specific signature in the rate itself. That is, the rate should be modulated on an annual basis due to the uh, relative motion of the Earth with respect to the galactic halo. The Earth uh, revolution against, um, around the Sun produces a modulation of the relative velocity of the Earth with respect to the wind, uh, wind let's say. And this velocity uh, uh, modulates in, in, uh, as a consequence also the rate you expect in your target. Um, in, in, in addition, this modulation should have uh, a specific uh, period, which is the, uh, the year uh, of revolution of the Earth around the sun, and a specific phase that is a maximum during the summer, possibly, exactly predicted to be on June the 2nd and uh, a minimum in, after six months in December. This effect is not very big. Uh, it is expected to be of the order of uh, uh, a few up to 10, let's say, percent of the total rate. 
And, um, but it is a very specific signature, which could not be explained by the backgrounds. A much larger uh, effect uh, and signature could be expected uh, due to the sidereal modulation of the direction of the incoming WIMP and as a consequence of the recoils uh, that you are looking for in your detector. If your detector, of course, uh, is uh, capable of detecting the direction of the recoils. So with a detector which is sufficiently sensitive and large uh, to detect at such low rates, but in addition also to detect the direction on an event by event basis, then you would have a specific signature which is a factor three larger than uh, the uh, annual modulation um, of the rate. We will see that uh, in this conference, uh, uh, we will have a devoted talk to the subject. I know that uh, Elisabetta Baracchini is going to present uh, tomorrow about uh, uh, the global effort that is being uh, pursued to this purpose. Uh, we are still uh, in the R&D phase for this kind of detectors uh, and they are not uh, yet at the sensitivity which is required by the current uh, limits on the dark matter. But nevertheless, this is very, very interesting. So going back to the annual modulation, it has already been shown by Paddy, these uh, famous results of the Dama Libra collaboration, which was updated a couple of years ago with the results of the phase two, uh, so-called phase two experiment, which confirms uh, over 20 annual cycles and with a very large significance of uh, 13 sigma almost, the observation of a uh, modulation of the number of events observed uh, in the detector, which is uh, uh, made of uh, sodium iodide uh, scintillator. This uh, rate of event is not uh, um, identified to be of nuclear recoils because the experiment doesn't have uh, the capability to discriminate uh, above uh, the um, very low expected background of electronic recoils. Nevertheless, uh, it has exactly the features that you would expect for the um, uh, galactic signal from WIMPs. That is, the period is exactly one year and the phase of the uh, modulation is in agreement with the expected one. So a very, very important result that has been uh, um, producing uh, really I don't know how many, but um, thousands of papers uh, for the, its possible interpretation and for the interpretation of its uh, uh, lack of confirmation from other experiments using different targets. We have seen, for instance, one of those papers cited by Paddy when he was mentioning the possibility to interpret these in terms of something which is not an elastic scattering, but an inelastic scattering of dark matter on the sodium iodide. Uh, another thing that should be noted is that the most recent result of DAMA, which you can see um, in the lower right corner uh, plot, um, managed to uh, lower the threshold in energy of this experiment down to one keV, so one uh, more uh, additional point with respect to the previous results. And uh, the, there have been uh, contributions in the literature uh, pointing out that this uh, makes much more difficult to uh, reconcile this result with uh, the standard so-called vanilla interpretation of the uh, signal in terms of a standard spin-independent WIMP uh, nucleon coupling. On the other hand, the collaboration uh, as um, criticized, is not accepted, is rejected this interpretation. And uh, on the other hand, the collaboration is also trying to improve in a phase three of the experiment, uh, the, uh, the, the energy threshold of the experiment, bringing it to even lower values. So this is something that we will see in the next years. And at the same time, a, uh, quite a diverse, let's say, uh, effort in the globe is going on in order to cross-check and, and um, possibly confirm the uh, signal observed in DAMA with other uh, experiments using the same target. So again, sodium iodide, possibly with the uh, additional feature of uh, discriminating the backgrounds, uh, which was not uh, done in DAMA, as I said. 
here on the lower left side, uh, you see the most, pub most recent published results from Anais and Cosine, the two experiments uh, which are being carried out uh, respectively in Spain, in the Canfranc laboratory and in uh, Korea. And uh, from the, um, their analysis of the data um, in terms of a possible modulation signal, you see that uh, these data are uh, still compatible both with uh, a confirmation of DAMA and with an exclusion of DAMA. They, are both com they can be also uh, compatible with a null result. So this was not conclusive, but it increased the push on the experiments. And it is very recent. The preliminary result uh, that was shown uh, less than one month ago uh, by um, the ANAIS collaboration, uh, uh, it is, I stress, a preliminary unpublished result. But uh, here again, you see the, um, the rate, the observed rate uh, in uh, um, in the in three years exposure, and you see in the upper right um, corner that uh, they find uh, a null result. That is actually they can measure a negative modulation amplitude, which is uh, incompatible with gamma at the level of 2.5, 2.6 uh, sigma. So not conclusive yet, but approaching approaching the three sigma um, sensitivity, which will be reached in more or less one year uh, from now. So this is exciting. I think that most of us who have been working in this field for, for the past 15 years uh, are very happy to see that finally all these experiments are becoming precise enough and sensitive enough to uh, confirm or um, uh, clarify in any case what is observed uh, in, uh, has been observed continuously for 20 years by the DAMA collaboration. What else? Uh, as I said, a few of these uh, um, tentatives, in particular, I would like to mention the cosinus um, experiment, which is being installed in uh, the Gran Sasso laboratory, try to exploit, in addition, the capability of identifying the nuclear recoils in your detector. And because uh, I stress up to now, we are interpreting the DAMA result in terms of nuclear recoils. We are not sure that uh, it is nuclear recoils. So how can you do that? It is well known. You uh, can rely on the um, opportunity to uh, uh, identify electron recoils, which are much more abundant and uh, produced by your natural radioactivity in the detector. Normally, gamma, electrons, uh, which are the more the most abundant uh, decays, uh, product of decays, natural decays of radioactive elements in your detector, produce electronic recoils. And electronic recoils uh, have uh, a minimum ionization with, uh, to be compared with uh, the very high uh, ionization density of nuclear recoils. So this gives you a tool to identify them by uh, essentially splitting the signal into uh, two or more components which respond differently to electronic recoils and to nuclear recoils. To the lower right uh, corner, you can see an example, very famous, of a detector measuring the ionization yield and the full energy released in, uh, in the detector in, in the form of heat. Once you plot nuclear recoils and electronic recoils in this uh, plane ionization versus total energy, they separate to a very large extent, giving you the opportunity to identify in your background. Of course, this you can do uh, to uh, reject electrons and gammas, but you are left with alpha and neutrons and uh, fragment fissions that produce nuclear recoils. What can you do uh, in order to discriminate and to identify th those uh, events which are exactly the same as your dark matter signal? Well, uh, the solution is to have a large enough uh, detector that allows you to identify the multiple interactions of the neutrons or uh, other uh, particles with respect to the WIMP who only, which only interacts once. Uh, the larger the experiment, the easier it is uh, to um, cut within the experiment a fiducial region which allows you to only consider the detector, the interactions within that uh, region. 
And this was essentially also the tool with, which was exploited by the Dama Libra uh, collaboration in order to reject uh, a fraction of its background. All the experiments running or planned today in the, both at low masses and at high masses are essentially exploiting this feature. And they have refined a lot to the technologies which are being developed in order to uh, exploit this, uh, uh, this technique of the double signal. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, several of the most expensive, uh, sorry, the most uh, sensitive experiments uh, um, exploit the uh, light produced in uh, a scintillating target together with either the charge, the ionization or the heat. Uh, in uh, in the bolometers, I have um, listed here the, the, the most sensitive experiments, and there are uh, quite uh, a number that I didn't mention because there are too many, and it's too difficult to really uh, describe all of them. I will only um, describe here the progress which is being made uh, made at the frontier of each of these technologies. So let me start. Uh, with uh, uh, the simplified uh, uh, overall look, let's say, of the, the scenario. And you see that there are two regions, one below 1 GV more or less, uh, which is uh, uh, defined normally as low threshold re region. That's the realm of the experiments that uh, need to lower the threshold in order to uh, be uh, sensitive to low energies, the low energies of recoil, which you get from low uh, from light particles and the region above 1 gv which is instead the so-called large mass region which is completely dominated by the experiments which are capable of uh, integrating large exposures so essentially the noble liquids which can produce very very large targets and uh, uh, thus sensitive enough uh, to go below the 10 to the minus 47 46 uh, square centimeters cross section. Both the regions in this moment are dominated by the liquid, uh, noble liquid experiments. Although the crest, uh, um, which is a uh, volumetric experiment, uh, can can have a sensitivity to even lower masses uh, uh, in this plot. So let's uh, let's uh, see first of all these uh, volumeters. Uh, the principle for the detection is uh, that of measuring essentially all the energy released by the WIMP in the interaction with the nucleus. Uh, essentially, in the, the large, largest fraction is released in terms of energy of uh, heat, and the heat is uh, measured in terms of a uh, temperature rise of the order of the microkelvin. This makes very difficult to integrate large masses for the detectors. We are approaching the tone scale with the CDMS um, program. Uh, but uh, in, at the moment, the uh, best limits on the low mass WIMP interactions are essentially produced either uh, by experiments that are releasing the capability, they are renouncing to the, their capability of uh, discriminating the background by essentially only measuring the heat and uh, the, in this also improving to very low levels the energy threshold or by the CREST experiment, which as I said, is uh, um, exploiting um, a cryogenic target, uh, which is also scintillating. So also producing light. So CREST uh, had a very long story of, uh, of good uh, results, which uh, have led the, 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 the field for several years. And the most recent result was obtained in 2018, so already two years ago, with a very small detector of the, with a mass which is only 24 grams. Of course, there were, there were several of these, a few of these uh, detectors, and uh, the collaboration managed to integrate uh, a few kilo days of uh, exposure with a very low threshold of only 30 electron volt. And in this way, the limit which is reached by, uh, by CREST is uh, a, a, just, uh, just above 160 MeV. So we are already uh, digging into the uh, region which Paddy was mentioning is mostly interesting at the moment to investigate not only WIMPs, but other possibly weakly interactive particles that are well below the 
uh, ordinary uh, WIMP range that is well below one GB. That is not anymore the limit. We are uh, already there. And there are also other experiments uh, with uh, different a little lower uh, sensitivity with respect to CREST that can investigate this region, in particular, all the silicon-based detectors. In, you, you see here the limit uh, which was set by DARMIC, and I will show you uh, later also another one by uh, Sensei collaboration, and they are both using silicon targets uh, in the form of CCDs. So this is a very uh, promising uh, field that is uh, um, pro making a lot of progress uh, um, recently, and we will come back uh, to this a little bit later. Another uh, important thing to note is that uh, the, other, the, the best limit above uh, 1.5, 1.8 GV is set by dark side um, 50. Dark side is uh, 50 is a small detector uh, for, for a liquid argon one, uh, it, well below the tone scale, uh, which uh, we will see is dominating uh, the high mass region. And nevertheless, uh, its capability of uh, understanding the backgrounds and lowering the threshold gave it the uh, possibility to uh, be competitive with uh, the uh, solid state detectors at masses of the order of 1 GV. So also the liquid, noble liquid detectors are reaching the sensitivity to this region <clears throat> below 1 GV. Excuse me, Juliana, just to let you know that you have 10 minutes left. Thank you. Uh, so let me now uh, go to the high mass region. The high mass region is dominated, as I said, by the noble liquids and uh, the technique which is used, universally used now by all the collaborations which have um, coalesced into very two, two or three large families is the uh, double-faced uh, TPC, the time projection chambers. Well, you already know how it works. I will not spend uh, a lot of time in describing this. And also I, um, I point you to the uh, talks that we are going to have tomorrow in the direct uh, detection section, both from uh, LZ and the Xin collaborations and from the Liquid Argon community. Uh, I would like here to point out that the, um, uh, the plus of the TPC technique uh, for the dark matter searches are two, two, in my opinion. The first one is that uh, they are capable of uh, financializing the, the volume because they have the capability to um, reconstruct the position in precision, in precision the, reconstruct, uh, the position of the interaction and so use the method to discriminate the sur surface background which affect uh, the solid state detectors. Second, uh, because you can uh, obtain very large masses, uh, tens and even hundred tons of uh, target material without losing the capability of uh, discriminating your background and uh, uh, going to very low threshold in energy. So here the, you see the uh, uh, summary of all the xenon experiments uh, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, starting with uh, the 10 kilos of the Xen 10 detector at uh, Gran Sasso and reaching now the 10, 10, 10 ton scale with LZ and uh, xenon N ton, which are just about to start uh, data taking at the end of this year or next, early next year. They are leading the um, current uh, uh, race towards the high mass uh, WIMPs. They have uh, reached uh, almost the level of the neutrino four. They, we are at 10 to the minus 47 square centimeters and uh, they promise to do even better. It, it, I, I will mention the two uh, particular, two specifically, two kind of results that are very recent. One uh, uh, is the uh, low mass uh, result obtained by dark side 50 with the argon and also by uh, xenon one ton. I will show it uh, in a moment um, immediately after. Above 3 GV, uh, xenon is leading the race and uh, below uh, it is dark side 50. The next step for the argon technique uh, will be a 20 ton detector, which is dark side 20K, which will be um, described tomorrow by Alex Kish. And uh, the specific feature of this detector with respect to the xenon is the one that you see in the central plot here, the capability to discriminate the backgrounds to a level which is unprecedented 
uh, the uh, argon technique uh, was proven by the deep experiment to be effective in terms of one over 10 to the 10 events. So you can uh, identify one nuclear recoil out of 10 to the 10 electron recoils. So this is very, very efficient for the IMAS uh, uh, search. While the ionization only channel is not capable of discriminating in the background, but it is capable of uh, nevertheless knowing uh, very, very well your electronic recoil backgrounds and giving you the opportunity to um, detect an excess of events over this expected background. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, the result from Zim one ton. Uh, as compared to a possible signal from a, a WIMP of uh, 6 or 10 GeV. So, as I said, the Xenon is also leading this race of, uh, in these, with this uh, kind of search in the uh, low mass uh, region above 3 GeV. And you can also interpret these results in terms of dark matter electron scattering. This is a uh, an interesting outcome of these uh, detectors, which is recent, because you can investigate uh, the um, possible candidates below the uh, 100 MeV, down to 10 MeV, by uh, looking for the interactions with the electrons instead, uh, then, instead of the interactions with the nucleus. So this is uh, an interesting uh, thing to, be, uh, to watch. And it is exactly one of these observations obtained in the standard search of xenon one ton. This is a very recent result uh, presented uh, on the archive uh, in June. Uh, as you know, uh, an excess of uh, events have been observed, 20, 285 events uh, versus 230 expected in the range just above the threshold of the experiment. So you see it is uh, in the region where the experiment starts to be sensitive. And this excess of events was uh, very welcome by the community, which produced a plethora of papers uh, in order to interpret uh, this excess in terms of uh, um, solar actions or ALPS or uh, even the neutrino magnetic mo moment, producing a lot of citations to the, this uh, paper, which is going to be published uh, in a few months. Although the collaboration itself uh, uh, cannot exclude that the excess of events is in fact due to background of uh, an, an accounted for background from tritium that could contaminate the, the xenon. So this is uh, to be um, clarified and it will be clarified as you see in the uh, lower right corner in less than one year run of the starting xenon Anton experiment. So very exciting results that we are expecting from Xenon. Let me say now, uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, two words on uh, the uh, possibility to investigate uh, <clears throat> the region in between these two very large areas of research. That is the region in between 1 and 5 GV, where the neutrino floor already approaches the existing uh, sensitivities. The directional experiment can say something and improve the current results. As you see here, the Cygnus sensitivity will tell something on, on this region. So it is uh, uh, very important to see what these experiments will be able to do. And this, as I said, is the subject of uh, Elisabetta's talk tomorrow. So I will not go into further details, but we have to keep an eye to these uh, experiments, which are just about to come online. Uh, this, I don't think have time to uh, describe the technique uh, that is most effective on the spin dependent coupling of WIMPs uh, to, um, to ordinary matter. I want to only underline from uh, this plot that was published by the PICO experiment that the uh, indirect searches for instance, of super K and ice cube are already uh, competitive with uh, these uh, direct searches. So here the interplay between direct and indirect searches is m more evident. And uh, let me conclude. Yes, okay, that is perfect. That, uh, as it has been said, the uh, current uh, paradigm is shifting from the idea of looking uh, only for WIMPs 
or for actions to the idea of looking for whatever. But one uh, specific uh, popular uh, area of research is becoming the lighter and weaking, weak uh, coupling. This area, as I promised, uh, <laughs> Uh, is being investigated essentially by the uh, solid state detector. So here are the recent results from the Sensei collaboration and a lot of other collaborations are going to produce similar results. And uh, from here, you just see that these experiments are sensitive to um, particles of mass of the order of one to 10 MeV with the uh, nucleon scattering and with the electron scattering. And if they look for electron, dark matter electron absorption, they are even sensitive below the uh, MeV down to the 10 electron, electron volt scale. So also here, uh, we should expect uh, a lot of new results. And that's uh, my conclusion and summary that I leave on screen for you. I concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliana. Thanks a lot for the very, very nice talk. So, um, I would like, first of all, to thank all three speakers. Uh, really, the, the talks were very inspiring, I guess, for everybody. And I think it was a very good way to start our, our workshop. So we received a couple of extremely technical questions, which uh, we, we would ask the, 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 the people to ask directly to the, to the speakers. So the speakers have kindly agreed to stay here for a few more minutes to answer questions. If there are uh, general questions, given the general nature of the talks, uh, yeah, please send them to us now or raise your hand or manifest yourself so that we can ask uh, the speakers before moving on to next session. Otherwise, you can contact the speakers privately and uh, and sort them out with them. Enrico, may I say one thing while we wait? Sure, for the... Yes, go Thank ahead. All the speakers again for the amazing uh, talks. Um, while we wait for people to either uh, manifest a general question or send them directly in the chat to the speakers, uh, we are obviously extremely sorry that we cannot offer you coffee or fruit which are usually what we serve, we serve during the, uh, the coffee breaks and the breaks of the, of the meeting. And there are typically Brazilian products, both coffee and fruit. So we, there is a little thing we can do uh, for your breaks. And that is to share with you if, uh, no, I, it doesn't let me do that. Oh, that's very unfortunate. So I will have to find a way to, um, to share a playlist of Brazilian music that actually is sharing that uh, I have created. It's a work in progress. And uh, if you wanna completely uh, um, detach yourself from the flow during the breaks, you can have something that reminds you of Brazil. I will update it during these days. That's our uh, sort of way to welcome you as a alternative coffee break, uh, an impact to Brazilian culture. And uh, back to the questions. Thanks, uh, Fabio. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We so, should send uh, coffee and snacks to everyone by Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that would be great. Even Caipirinha, to be honest. Uh, yeah, you see, Martin in the chat is uh, is asking for a Caipirinha recipe. That, that's so a spot. I, that's, really yeah. a spot. that's what we want to do. So I, I don't see any general question in the chat right now. So um, before concluding... A, I just wanted to say that we received a, a few questions via, via the chat and we are okay. replying via... So okay. Do you think there are some general questions that you would like to address publicly? They were mostly following up with uh, you know, questions about references and where they can find more information and things like that. Um, if there are I, questions I just that, received a message with a question um, about direct detection, so maybe I should read it to uh, Juliana. I, I don't know. Fabio, did you have questions yourself too? I think, uh, no, I don't have questions that I haven't received. And maybe if we can let Gianfranco and then you can pass the question to yeah. Juliana. Let's take it more or less in the order of the speakers. So Gianfranco was saying something about references. Okay, and sorry. So then, I'll, I'll read the question to Juliana later on or? Yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. Gianfranco, please go ahead. 
I, I was just, uh, you know, finishing the, the, the sentence, I didn't have much more to say, you know, if, if people want to ask uh, further, you know, for references and things like that, feel free to uh, ask via the chat or drop me an email. Uh, I think the, the same applies to the other speakers. That's all I wanted to say. Yvonne, please, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Gianfranco. Okay, so the question here is from Valentina Cesare. And uh, so she would like to make a question about direct detection. And the question is why other Nobel gases like Krypton, for example, are not exploited in detectors like argon and xenon? So uh, there, are, there have been uh, R&D um, developed uh, during the years, in particular by the deep collaboration, but also by other collaborations in order to exploit other gases, like, uh, for instance, neon. And there are reasons, uh, good reasons, to um, prefer xenon and argon, <clears throat> which are quite different. Actually, you have seen that xenon being heavier, you can... Uh, you can uh, produce experiments which are very large, very effective with uh, uh, a limited amount of xenon. Argon uh, uh, is lighter. You need mo more or less five times uh, as much uh, argon <laughs> as xenon in order to uh, reach the same sensitivity. On the other end, with argon, you have access to this pulse shape discrimination that I mentioned that give you the possibility to increase the um, exposure uh, without losing uh, the capability of discriminating with the ground. This is not feasible with other, uh, with other noble gases and privileges in some way the uh, argon. On the other end, uh, other, other differences that are there are the, uh, the um, sorry, the wavelength of the light emitted by these uh, uh, noble gases in the case of xenon, it is very advantageous because uh, it's not in the it's in the near ultraviolet. So the photosensors are still sensitive to this light, while for the other noble gases, you you must wavelength shift them. So there are pros and contras with each of these noble gases that at the end have resulted in a selection of these two noble gases. In the case of krypton, in particular. You have uh, contaminants which are radioactive, so it's, uh, I don't think that, that that would be the best choice. I don't know if this was the answer that was uh, requested. Maybe, okay, maybe let's see, a mo let's wait a moment to see if there is some reply from, uh, from Valentina. Yes, so she thanked you and that it answered her question, thanks. Okay, great. So I think, uh, uh, let me check again. Yeah, I don't see anything in my chat. Uh, so Yvonne, did you receive anything else? No, so far. Okay, no. okay. so uh, I, I would uh, like to ask uh, the three speakers, uh, Gianfranco, Paddy and Giuliana, to turn on their cameras so that we can thank them again for the last time before closing uh, the <laughs> before closing the session. So thank you very much. Uh, for the very, very nice talks. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure to have you here. And uh, so thanks again. Uh, I'm not opening the microphone to everybody because it would be a mess, but uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so we reconvene.